Okay. Um, so as Jennifer mentioned, um, we're going to be uh, going over an introduction to LOINC over the next hour. Um, and the primary stuff we're going to talk about is the overall purpose and scope of LOINC, um, the LOINC concept model, um, additional attributes that we have with each of the terms, um, resources that are available for implementing LOINC so that, you know, a lot of it that we don't can't cover just within this time, you can go to those resources and hopefully those will be helpful for you. And then um, I will do my best to save enough time at the end for Q&A so that we can um, address any questions that you might have. Um, I'm going to jump back to the disclosure slide. So I just want to re listed here the core funding sources that we have as well as the secondary ones. Um, And before I actually jump in, I just wanted to say that I'm one of the clinical terminology developers on the LOINC team, and I've been with LOINC for nearly almost 10 years now. Um, my background was in genetic counseling prior to that, um, and I did a lot of research-based work with in genetic counseling, um, and then also saw patients in the clinical setting. So I had quite a mix of experience between um, research as well as clinical applications. Um, and interfaces. And so when I joined the LOINC team, all of that background experience was really helpful in terms of understanding uh, interoperability and the need to share the data and be able to pull the data um, for clinical decision support. So um, we have kind of two main different kinds of standards that we talk about. Uh, one of them is the syntax standards, and then the other is semantic standards. The syntax standards um, represent, you know, messaging documents, APIs, and how those should be structured. And so examples of those are like HL7, CCDA, FHIR. Um, these are also called like technical standards. And then the semantic standards are kind of the meaning of what's in those syntax standards. And those are defined by vocabulary or code systems like LOINC, SNOMED CT, RxNorm, and so on. Um, Dr. Tripathi and Dr. MB this morning talked a lot about learning healthcare systems, and these different standards are what enable that. They enable the systems to learn and to understand, and so without these, we can't have learning healthcare systems, um, and so it's really important to have both the structure defined um, and a agreed upon way of sending that information as well as the semantic aspect of everything, the meaning of everything. So here's a representation of three different hospitals that all are reporting on the patient's systolic blood pressure. This is just an example, HL7 version two, um, just a snippet from that message. So the result is being sent from these different hospitals, um, but each of them has their own local code that's in the red font, their own naming of that observation in the blue font, and then each hospital is represented in the green font. This is a triplet code. And so the goal of LOINC is to have the same information represented by a single standardized code so that all three of these hospitals can talk to each other. Um, within most um, some, uh, syntax standards or messaging standard uh, applications, there is a way to send both the standardized code as well as the local code. And we often actually, we do encourage that um, because then you have the full information sent, you know, the original local information that was provided as well as the mapping to that standardized coding system like LOINC. But this would be the goal where they can all have the same representation and so that um, these systems can then understand and know where to store this result, how to display this result. Um, and it's just helpful in general with data exchange. Just a brief history of LOINC. So it was about 1994 when Clem McDonald realized there was a need for a universal language for observation identifiers. Um, and they began at that time with laboratory observations. And then within a couple of years, they started adding the clinical observations. So now in LOINC, we have over 95,000 codes for both laboratory and clinical order and result concepts um, 
for health measurements, observations, and documents. And if you didn't know, LOINC stands for Logical Observation Identifiers, Names, and Codes. So the LOINC development is main, maintained by the LOINC team at Regan Street Institute um, in Indianapolis. And we have three primary committees, the laboratory, clinical, and then the combined LOINC Radlux committee, as well as two subcommittees that help provide that oversight and guidance um, for content development. And we also have a vibrant international user community um, with active participation in the LOINC development activities. And we are very appreciative of both all the committee um, participants as well as all of our volunteers who help. So LOINC adoption around the world, it began in the US, but it's used in over 170 countries. Um, and it's the official national standard in over 30 countries currently that we are aware of. There may be more, but that, what, that we are officially aware of, we know of at least 30. Um, international adoption is enabled through our volunteers who translate LOINC. And currently we have over 20 different variants in 12 languages. And um, we're always interested in uh, adding to those translations um, so that we can continue that um, international adoption. The scope of LOINC, um, it's a standard terminology to identify lab tests, clinical measurements, documents, surveys, and more. Uh, so there's one common identifier for results that are clinically the same. And as I mentioned, there's nearly 95,000 uh, terms and growing. Um, about 60% of those are lab LOINC terms. And uh, then we also have the clinical terms. I believe those are around 20 some thousand uh, terms. We have this class of HIPAA attachments right now. Um, and I'm just gonna briefly mention with that class, it actually kind of overlaps between the clinical LOINC class as well as, as, well as ter terms that are in the laboratory space and maybe even survey, just because the payer provider exchange information often involves coding that's the same um, that would be used in clinical link, for instance. And so there's a lot of overlap really between all of these classes, but in order to generally generalize and classify everything, we have them grouped into these four categories. Um, and then the last one is the standardized survey instruments. So in laboratory LOINC, we have uh, test codes for routine testing, like inpatient hospital labs and outpatient labs, um, testing that's done in provider offices. We have um, tests that are performed by patients in their homes. Um, we have specialized laboratory testing, um, newborn screening terms, veterinary terms. We have public health, epidemiology. And you can kind of see the wordle over there is showing all the different uh, domains or classes that we have of laboratory terms in chemistry and microbiology, drug tox, and so on. And then in clinical LOINC, um, there's terms that include all types of measurements, procedures, documents, and other clinical information. And in general, these are not in the laboratory domain. Um, so anything that can be kind of done on a patient in a way. Um, and then anthropo promorphic measurements, vital signs, history and physical exam findings. We have lots of codes for procedures, um, as well as ophthalmology codes and clinical notes and much more. So there's a whole vast amount of um, terms in the clinical blank space. The clinical terms and survey terms in a way overlap. Um, and as well, we also have laboratory terms that are used within survey collections. Um, but the survey terms are primarily representing patient reported outcomes and provider completed forms. And they include like functional assessments, um, government required forms, behavior health, uh, psychiatry, substance abuse assessments. Um, and many of the long term attributes that we're going to talk about here pretty soon. So the things that define a LOINC term or assigned to a LOINC term, um, such as a survey question text that's on the form. So the exact survey question text or an observation ID that is on the form um, and helps you know, point out which term we're talking about or the skip logic 
and then copyright information if it's a copyrighted uh, form. Those were all created for surveys primarily. Um, and as I had mentioned earlier, lab was, you know, it, Link started out with laboratory terms. And so a lot of these fields did not exist at the time. A lot of these attributes, um, it wasn't until we started adding the survey content where we started adding more um, attributes like these in order to support accurately representing survey terms in the link. So we have codes for individual observations or tests um, or measurements done on a patient. And you can see some examples there. So these would have that single result value for a body weight or a number of steps, anything like that. Um, we also have codes in the link for collections uh, like panels. So we often call these panels, um, but they're also document codes that represent collections of information. So a panel, um, the first one listed there, the CBC with auto diff will have children underneath it, which represents those individual observations um, like you see above where it's single codes underneath that panel. Um, but then the last one that is mentioned there, the discharge summary, um, that one doesn't, isn't populated with link codes underneath, um, but it is intended to represent a collection of information um, about the patient's discharge, um, which may contain structured or unstructured data. So it may contain a lot of additional link codes underneath it when it's sent, um, but we don't populate those codes in the link just because it varies across providers, what information will be gathered. And this is another place where the syntax standard or the technical standards fit in and they help define like in CCDA, how will that discharge summary note be structured and what kinds of information will be contained within it. Um, that, those are the things that help define um, what will be in there. And LOINC's purpose is just to say 18842-5, for instance, represents a discharge summary note. And then you look inside that based on that syntax standard, what content or information or collection will be included. So I'm gonna dive into the link concept model next. Um, we have what we call the link term and the link term um, makes is the combination of the link code as well as the link name. So those two together we consider, we define as the link term. And that term represents a question or observation about a clinical phenomenon that can be observed or measured. So the example we have here is 94500-6, one of the most commonly used link codes for SARS-CoV-2 testing. Um, and you can see that the top there represents the full link term, which is the code plus the long common name. And so then you have that split out below. So it, it often gets confusing because sometimes people are just talking about a code or they're talking about a name or, but we kind of think of all of it together um, combined as considered the link term. So the LOINC code itself is a unique, unique permanent numeric code. Um, it serves as a computer process, processable representation of a LOINC term. And there's no structure, intrinsic structure, except that the last character is a mod 10 check digit. And if you're really curious, you can go into our knowledge base and look in the user's guide at Appendix C on calculating that mod 10 check digit. Um, the only thing you can really determine by the link code um, is when it might have been created. You can see that the older codes, like the one listed down below, the 1-8, um, is one of the first codes that were created versus that one I just showed you earlier. The 9 uh, number is a very recent code, a much newer code. Um, so that's the only thing you can really determine by the link code value. They're not organized by like, all the four ones beginning with four, four something are lab and all the ones beginning with six something are clinical or whatever. We don't, we don't have the codes organized in that way. They are all kind of processed as we um, receive them in the order that they're received or, and then, yeah, otherwise there's no intrinsic structure. So, and then once a link code is officially released, it's included in an official release, 
it is always going to be in that in future releases. It is never removed from the LOINC distribution. The LOINC name um, is the human readable text rendering of its associated LOINC code. And we have several official LOINC name types. One of them is the fully specified name. And we often, we do recommend this one for mapping. And I'll show you more as why. Um, the LOINC or the long common name is our primary display name. And then we have a short name, which is often was created for old school systems where there was a character limit and those systems still exist today. So just some examples for the fully specified name, you can see there that each piece of the LOINC term is divided or has a colon separated by a colon. So we have what we call different axes in a LOINC term. Um, and we'll go into each of those axes. But there are six of them. And so you have six different pieces there listed. Um, and then the long common name is that readable rendering of all of those different axes values. And we generate these internally by rules that we have. Um, and sometimes we, they're based on the common usage of that name so that uh, users can find that code and understand its meaning. And then short names um, is also generated by rules internally um, and based on each of the parts. So the link fully specified name, the first one is the component or analyte. Analyte is commonly used in lab, um, but when you, know, you start talking about the clinical space, analyte just doesn't make as much sense. Um, so component tends to be more um, frequently used to describe that first axis. Um, and then the second axis is the property, which is the dimension of the analyte that is being measured. Um, the third part or the third axis is the timing or the time aspect. And that's whether the analyte or observation is measured at a moment in time, which is most common. And we call that PT for point in time or over a specific period of time. Um, like 24 hours and so on. The system is our fourth axis, and that represents the sample that was tested, the setting, the body region, and so on. And we'll go through examples for each of these. The scale is the fifth axis, and that's just a general classification of the result type. So like whether it's quantitative, whether it's qualitative, um, narrative, and so on. And then method is how the analyte was measured. And this is the only major axis that does not have to be populated for every LOINC term. Um, so some LOINC terms are only gonna have the component, property, time, system, and scale populated. And that's fine. Um, and the method will be null and that is intentional. And then other terms where it's important, we will specify the method. So the component is that substance or entity that is measured, evaluated, or observed. And there's some examples there that are listed, like walking speed, breasts, um, heartbeats, cardiac output, influenza virus, or as we all know well, the uh, SARS coronavirus 2. Um, all of those are examples of components or entities or things that are actually measured. And that component is broken down into three subparts, three main subparts. We have that very first thing, that analyte name, but then there may also be a challenge that gets added. Um, and so you'll see this like in chemistry or other times where you have um, different challenges that take place and then adjustments. So the component, the first part would be like calcium or SARS coronavirus 2 antigen, body weight, those examples there. We may also have a divisor as part of that. So that whole analyte consists of like oxyhemoglobin to he total hemoglobin ratio. Um, all of that is considered that first part, that analyte that's being measured and recorded on. And then the second part represents whether it was one minute post birth or if it's the body weight was measured with clothes on. So it's that kind of additional challenge, so to speak. Um, associated with that analyte. And then the third part is an adjustment. So um, 
if it's adjusted to the patient's actual body temperature or corrected for heart rate, different things like that, you'll see um, the third, after the second carrot, there's the second hat, whatever you want to call it, the adjustment. The property, um, the second axis in our long term is the characteristic or attribute of the component that is measured, evaluated, or observed. So we have the the characteristic of it, whether it's a type of something, whether it's a time, so like age, if age is being reported um, on a patient, that represents a duration of time for that patient, like how old they are, what is their age. And so time would be the property for um, reporting someone's age, uh, color of something, um, and appearance or an area, uh, length. All of these different things are characteristics or attributes of that component. The property is one of the most difficult axes to really understand. Um, so if you're mapping, spend time to kind of read about it in the user's guide and dig into it and understand it. Um, for all quantitative measurements, so when you have a numeric value that is resulted, a number of any kind, um, you must choose the link with a property that reflects that reported units of measure. And then on the right there, I just listed some of the top current top 10 properties in lab. Um, there's not a lot of them. Um, and really most of them, in, especially in the lab space, will fall under that mass concentration or it might be presence, absence of something. So that would be the first one there, that PRTHR, which represents presence or threshold. Um, arbitrary concentration is very common for international units of measure um, or arbitrary units, you know, that, um, and then substance concentration is the fourth one and then tighter and so on. So there are really pretty common ones. Um, so once you get pretty familiar with the units that are reported in the lab um, or that you're seeing being reported, you can start to be pretty comfortable with which property that, that aligns with in the link. Timing is the, let's see, what are we on? The third axis. Um, and the interval of time over which the observation or measurement was made. So PT, again, a point in time or a moment, which is, again, the most common one. Study minim, um, with minimum, the adjustment of minimum over a period, which represents a minimum over a period of a study. Um, we have like study hat maximum or study carrot um, mean. So we have all the different representations for mean, max, and min. Um, 24 hour, a 24 hour shift, or maybe a 24 hour urine specimen, all those things would be represented by the timing. And then just a little tip down below there, you see if timing is not PT, then the property is often a rate, like a number rate or a mass rate or substance rate. Um, so just keep that in mind. The system um, is the context or setting or body part for which the observation was made. So uh, examples include the yolk sac, uh, the upper GI tract, tricuspid valve. So whatever we're talking about, whatever that analyte is um, referring to or um, the body part for which it was made, that would be your system. Um, in the document space, the system represents the setting. So like outpatient, emergency department, um, and so on. So uh, in the lab space, it's the specimen usually that's tested. And the assumption is that that specimen was um, from the patient. And if it's not from the patient, then we uh, represent that in the super system and indicate uh, the source. So the first example there, that yolk sac uh, with the carrot fetus or hat fetus, that means that the measurement is taken or the whatever it may be, but in this case, probably measurement was taken on the yolk sac from the fetus. Um, this helps distinguish between the patient, which may be the mother or whoever it is, from the fetus. The scale is the type of data reported for the substance or entity being observed. So uh, for quantitative measurements, our scale is QN, 
for ordinal, where it's a rank, um, where you have mild, moderate, severe, the one plus, two plus, three plus, and so on, um, positive, negative, those are all considered ordinal in LOINC. The nominal scale is where you have a list, you know, that can be reported in no relative order. Um, and anything that's kind of finite that can be drawn from a list of um, possible result values. So like stool appearance, skin color, uh, types of things like chest tube type. Uh, nominal also fits brief, really brief text. So in some cases, people may say, what's the address for this patient? Um, that would be nominal or um, they want to know, do they have a symptom of any kind? And they allow patients to kind of write in what that symptom is. Um, that also would be considered nominal if there's just a written in text or information. It's when it's a long descriptive narrative text is when we would use that NAIR scale, like when there's an overall interpretation of something and um, the, the review you know, is lengthy, it's more paragraph-like, that would be considered a narr narrative scale. Um, and then document, uh, I talked about this previously where we have clinical notes um, or collections of information and those we currently represent with the scale of DOC in the link. So for surveys and panels where we have those collections um, with LOINC codes enumerated underneath, um, those often have a scale of a dash because the individual elements within that set um, often have different scales. The same is true with the property for surveys and panels. They often have dashes in both of those axes just because of the different ver you know, child elements underneath. And then our last, our six axes is the method. Um, this is the procedure used to make the measurement or observation. Um, and some examples are measured, estimated, observed, calculated, uh, ultrasound. Um, US is what we have for ultrasound, EKG, and so on. You can see all the ones that are listed and there are many more um, that we have. Method is only included when it makes an important distinction in the sensitivity or specificity um, of that result. And then other cases where method may or may not be included um, is for depending on the interoperability or the modeling. Um, some, some places will report method elsewhere and, and use a methodless link code to report all the results. Um, so it's different modeling situations too, um, but if it does make an important clinical distinction, then we do try to specify that method. So putting it all together, I have some examples here where um, the differences between the codes, so there's two terms, um, and the difference between those terms are underlined. Um, so for like the first one with sodium, you can see in the system, urine, is the system for 2955-3 for sodium. And then CSF or cerebral spinal fluid is the system for 2948-8. So that is the only difference between those two codes. Otherwise, they are the same. They're both measuring sodium. They're both reporting in moles per volume. Um, so a substance concentration. Um, the only difference, they're both, so they're both quantitative and they're both done at a point in time. And then the only difference is that specimen. One's done on urine and the other one's done on CSF. And then body weight, the next example below, the only difference here is the system. One's um, measuring the patient's body weight. Another is measuring the body weight, the fetal body weight. And that one as well is saying how it's being measured. In this case, it's estimated from the abdominal circumference on ultrasound. Some more examples, we have the top one for heart rate. We have the component is the heart rate, which is what's being measured. It's a number rate. Um, it's the timing is PT and then the system is different. The first one isn't saying what the system is. Um, it's unspecified and so it could be any uh, system. And then it also does not have a method specified. 
The second term, the 8893-0, is much more specific. It's heart rate um, of the peripheral artery by palpitation. So it's much more specific, and in certain use cases, they need that distinction. Um, and 8867-4 would be too general for them. So the last, or the other example that's there, the SARS coronavirus 2 antibody, and then the SARS coronavirus 2 RNA, these two codes are measuring different things, different analytes. So the first one is looking, is a serology test looking at the antibody for SARS-CoV-2. And the second test is a molecular test looking at the RNA or the nucleic acids um, and detecting those um, in a specimen from SARS-CoV-2. So the, there's a big distinction there. The other distinction is the first code is um, testing serum or plasma and it's done by an immunoassay. And then in the second one, it's a respiratory specimen. So any rest, upper or lower respiratory specimen, and it's done by nucleic acid amplification with a probe detection. So each of those items make those two codes very different and unique. So we have lots of other attributes on a loin term. The six that we just talked about, those six axes, those are what define a given term. So those are the primary um, uh, descriptions or information that you should need in order to do the mapping. But we have many other attributes that are associated with each term for different purposes. And we do this to help users understand the meaning of a term, to organize terms and make them easier to find. Uh, the other attributes provide metadata, such as like the version in which it was first released or maybe the version when it was last updated. Um, they also provide information surrounding the use of a term, such as copyright. So if a term is copyrighted, that will alert a user that they need to seek approval from the intellectual property holder of that instrument. I have examples here for different attributes. So for example, units, we often get questions from users like, this term has milligrams per deciliter, but mine's milligrams per liter. Can I still use it? Um, yes, you absolutely can. As long as your units align with that property that we talked about. So as long as they're a mass concentration, just like your units are mass concentration, then you can use that. Um, the units that we have, both the example and the UCUM units that we have with our terms are intended to be examples and help with mapping. Um, they are not intended to be the only units that can be used. And then we have a formula. So if a term is about um, is calculated based on a very specific formula, we will include that with the link term. Uh, the type, like the general classification about the term. So the overall type of term, whether it's lab, that would be a type one. Clinical is a type two term. So and hip attachments are type three, and survey is type four. So you may um, hear people talk about or see a search being done in LOINC on type one terms, and those are representing all the laboratory terms. And the type name, the next one, is um, defining that one, two, three, four. So the laboratory, clinical attachments and surveys. We have class um, specifications for terms, so microbiology, chemistry. These are you know, helping organize or find terms uh, the status of a term, whether it's active, discouraged, discouraged or deprecated in trial, uh, order OBS, whether it's an order only, which you would see with panels, um, like it's not intended to be resulted with a single result, it is intended just for ordering, um, then it would have that order OBS value of order. If it's an observation only, it would never be ordered on its own, then it would be labeled as observation, and then both, meaning it can be ordered or be an observation. We have related names, and these are like synonyms um, throughout LOINC for every term. We have answer lists for qualitative and nominal uh, codes. Um, so ordinal results like detected, not detected. Uh, again, these are intended to help users know whether or not this is the code that they need. They're not intended to have all possible choices there. Uh, they're just intended to be examples in lab for the most, um, in, the, in the most case. In surveys, it's a little bit different because those 
are validated assessments usually. And so those answer lists, um, depending on the type, which is right below the answer list type, depending on that binding of whether it's an example, preferred or normative will indicate um, how that answer list should be used. Uh, survey question text, um, external copyright, all these are different attributes of a given link code. Version last change we talked about, we talked about where um, if a term was updated in the last release, for instance, it would have a version last change of 2.69. Um, and then change type, whether it was a, the term was deprecated would be DEL. Um, uh, name change, panel change, all those different change types um, help indicate what the type of change um, was for that term. And then descriptions, we have information for both at the part level as well as term level um, information, descriptions. All of these um, attributes are available on our detail page and you're not intended or to be able to see this, it's just meant to show you that there's a lot of information on our detail page with all of these different attributes. So we have also relationships to other terminologies. And so for our terms, um, we, we link to different terminologies at multiple levels, to terms, to parts, and to answer strings. Um, and so for terms, we, for instance, link to the radiology procedure codes uh, where they exist, the playbook codes. Um, and then for parts in radiology, we, we hook up our parts to the radiology concepts, the RIDs. Uh, so in terms as well, we have the IEEE device nomenclature linkages and um, Phoenix, the Phoenix toolkit, we have linkages to their unique IDs. Um, and then on the parts side, we link to KEBI and the NCBI gene and taxonomy and ClinVar um, uh, terminologies. And then also SNOMED, we have linkages to uh, SNOMED CT codes to our part codes. And these links were created either um, as a primary link effort or as part of a collaboration with other organizations. And the relationships are included in various formats in that public link release. So what's not part of a link code? Um, the instrument that's used in the testing, for instance, uh, details about the site of the collection, uh, the priority, whether it was stat or routine, um, the doctor or provider or whoever it is that verified the result uh, wouldn't be included, um, the size of the sample collected, uh, the place of testing. We recently received a request for a test done at home um, and they needed it for insurance purposes, but we have to date not distinguished whether the test was done at home or was done by the bedside or in a clinical lab. Um, sometimes the specimen can indicate that it was a point of care test, um, if it was whole blood, for instance, or something like that, but we don't specify that this is a point of care test. So LOINC code development guidelines, we try to only make names and codes for things that are real concepts that actually are um, exist in some, someone's system. We don't make all possible permutations. So as uh, SARS coronavirus, as the pandemic happened and tests were being developed, um, even though we knew there would be a SARS antibody test being developed, we didn't just go ahead and create that code. We, waited for an actual request from a user and with a test kit, valid test kit, um, before we made that code. So there aren't any blind cross products or creations of codes. Um, we do make names that allow both the atomic, you know, post-coordinated and molecular pre-coordinated styles. And that's where the method versus method list can sometimes fit in. Um, we avoid creating codes for concepts that are represented in the HL7 model. Um, so no names that include post-coordinated fields from other parts of the HL7 message, like the status or the priority or user role. Um, where we do have codes that overlap is um, it, where we do have that situation, we try to provide 
where it can be long in the other standards. So we have a field in MOIC that says in HL7B2, you can put this in the PID segment um, for representing, you know, like we talked about earlier today, the patient name. Um, so we do try to represent that, although we haven't done that for a lot, everything. Um, but the goal is to eventually have you know, one best practices or one approach for how we send this information. Um, and so we try not to overlap with that. So we have lots of resources available for implementing LOINC. Our main page for getting the content, um, getting the release is on loinc.org slash downloads. And here you can download the complete package or you can get just the link table, um, you can get the Realma tool, um, or you can get the individual accessory files, depending on your use. The link table has the main uh, link database content, and we currently distribute it in two formats. We have the full link table, which has a lot of other term attributes, and then we have the core link table. And the idea between having the two is that you know, over time we may add additional fields to the full length table or remove fields or make changes, but that can be hard on users for implementation and maintenance. And so we have this core length table that um, is the essential fields with a stable structure. And this table I think is a three year um, requirement to be able to announce or to, for us to announce that there will be a change to it and then to give uh, the user's time to be able to implement that change. So it's a much more stable uh, structure. Both of these come with a map to file for transversing between the deprecated or discouraged terms to the active terms. And the link table has run record per term. Um, and so you will have a given link term with the link code and then the six axes. And then you'll have all the different other attributes, the long common name, short name, class type, and so on. So each of these axes is one record per term in that table. We have accessory files um, the for parts and hierarchy, document ontology, um, you know, all kinds of various accessory files. And each of these has a readme um, and currently a release notes included in the download so that you can, and I highly recommend taking a look at that readme to understand like what's contained in the file um, and, you know, any, recommendations as far as understanding the content. We have tools that you can use for mapping your local terms to LOINC. If you're just simply doing a one-on-one -on -one mapping, you're looking at a single term and you're trying to find the right LOINC code, um, currently our search.loink is a great way to do that. We have two versions right now. We have the original one that we um, that has been out there where you can search and browse different link codes. It's very fast and uh, easy to use, I think. And then we have this new one that we've developed that's even better. It enables searching for link terms, parts, answer lists, and groups. So you can do a lot with this new beta search. And we really encourage you to use it um, and let us know if there's any um, issues that you're having or any recommendations. We always appreciate that feedback. The other mapping tool that we've had for a while is with Realma. And with Realma, currently, you can upload your local test um, code file. And then it can um, assist with doing the mappings for you. This tool we will be phasing out over the next few years just because um, it's a very old uh, web-based tool that is, has been difficult to maintain over the years. And um, it just needs to be updated. So. It will eventually be um, phased out and then we'll be working to migrate some of the features uh, to an online platform. So, and then once those features are there, then this one will be retired. The, we have a link panel browser where if you're working on mapping some of your panels or you're wanting to know what we have in the link for panels, you can uh, search the panel browser um, and there, organized by different categories. The lab categories are primarily based on the associated link class for each term. And the non-lab ones are organized based on that top level category, such as the clinical specialty um, or the government agency. This too is a work in progress and any feedback 
or suggestions are welcome. There's lots of additional free resources online. We have our LOINC knowledge base that contains the user's guide, um, release notes, Realma manual, and so on. So there's lots there in the, um, in the knowledge base. We also have a quick start guide um, and slides that you can review, lots of readings. Um, the domain specific content is, is helpful if you're sp specifically working in uh, clinical notes or document ontology space. Um, it might be helpful to review that, social determinants of health, um, newborn screening, and so on. Uh, we are actively working on domain-specific guides. We have a microbiology guide that's been published. Um, we're working on many others, chemistry, allergy, and so on. And all of those, um, or most of those, are still under development. And then we have the Link Fire terminology server that you can take a look at. The legal stuff with Link is we often ask, can I use it, um, especially from app developers more recently and others, they wonder, is there anything they need to do or can they just use it? Um, so yeah, it's no cost use. It's used worldwide um, for commercial and non-commercial purposes. And um, we encourage translations. The main thing is, is you cannot use any of the licensed material to develop or propagate a different standard for orders or observations. So essentially you can't create a new standard with the LOINC standard. Other than that, um, um, it's free for use. There's lots of ways that you can stay connected with our community too. And many of you may already know this um, with signing up for the webinar um, and meetings, but we have a mailing list. You can follow us on Twitter. Uh, we have an adopter, LOINC adopters page. Um, the Link Users Forum is what we often recommend for reaching out to other users and asking questions. There's also a wealth of, you know, information there on questions that have been asked in the past and responses to those questions. Uh, so I encourage, you know, people to look at that. Um, we always welcome new committee members and uh, premium members. So uh, that is all. So this is. Um, thank you so much for listening, and I'd be glad to take any questions at this time. Amy, before we jump into any questions, um, Lisa's had her hand raised for quite a bit. So Lisa, if you had a comment, um, you want to drop it in the Q&A for us, or if um, Jen can give you permission to speak. Yes, Lisa, you have permission to speak. I think Lisa, I think you might be muted. I'm sorry, I, I didn't oh. remember I had my hand open. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> no problem. Okay, I didn't want to miss you. <laughs> Jamie, we had a couple other questions in the QA for you. So the first one was why do we need a separate LOIC code for test results and test orders? Um, some of the orders re represent like a battery, a set of tests. So it's not one specific code. Um, like you think of the CBCs with differential or example that we had. Um, in those cases, you need a unique code that represents that whole battery, that whole collection of tests that's going to be ordered. Um, and then you need separate codes to represent each of the different quantitative ordinal results for everything you know that might be included within that report. So you can kind of think of an order representing the overall report, you know, information, and then the result codes are kind of contained within that report. A lot of lab tests have the exact same order code and result code. So if it's a single test um, or a single item that's analyzed or their single primary test. There may be other associated observations with that test, but if it's a single um, primary result that's reported out, we, we recommend that same code be used for the order as well. So it's really when there's a large collection or battery or panel um, is where the order code would be different. Thank you. And that kind of leads into our next question. And you talked about it a little bit. So a panel for a CBC that has a panel code, do you map to the panel header and the components can individuals map to components only? Uh, you can map, not all systems are capable of handling order codes right now, LOINC order codes. And, and maybe I'm misunderstanding the question, but 
Um, yeah, so you can map to that order code and then each of the results will be then mapped to um, their corresponding codes. But maybe I'm misunderstanding the question. Leanne, if you had a follow-up question to that, we'd be happy to answer. And we had one more question come in. Um, Lexi just wants clarification. If they have a test with a single test in their local system, is this considered a panel if it contains multiple results generated from one assay in the lab? Um, it, so it depends on what the additional results are, but if it's just one primary measurement, um, for example, we just had a recent discussion about a urine analysis or where the, re, the ratio is being reported, you know, the analyte to creatinine ratio or whatever it might be. In that result um, or report, there may be additional um, results reported along with it, um, but they're not the primary. The primary result would be that ratio. And so the recommendation would then be to map your order code to that primary result. And that's when you have that single analyte that's, you know, and primary result that's being reported. It's again, only when you have a collection of codes uh, of results that are um, different measurements, um, different results. Like when you have a complete blood count and you have all the different results associated with that, where you would have a panel code be the order. If we have time, I think I wanna just kind of then show a little bit on our website to help okay, great. users find some of the content that I mentioned. Um, Okay. All right, so here we have, um, if I go back, we have our main landing page for loink.org. Um, here is where you can find all kinds of additional information about getting started, our knowledge base, which contains the license, the Link user, the release notes, information about versioning um, and so on, as well as our user's guide. And you can easily jump to a section that you might be interested in. Um, if you're working on radiology codes, we have this um, Link RSNA radiology playbook user's guide here. Um, the next talk with Brene and Tim, they're gonna be going over our search syntax, but there's some really helpful information here on searching in Link. Um, and then this is our Realma user's guide, information about using that tool, as well as FAQs. So there's a wealth of information in our knowledge base that I recommend uh, reading and using um, because it, and, and referring to whenever you have a question about something. Um, then we have the whole content space um, that talks about different domains, specific domains like the document ontology and social determinants of health. Um, and the work that we're doing there. Um, if you need to request a new term because you can't find uh, the one that you need, this is the space that you go to to look at what's actually in our queue. Um, you can first, oops, first search the whole queue um, to see what's in there prior to submission, submitting because quite often um, there may be someone else who's already requested that exact same term. And so um, you can actually do a search in this queue for specific features or about that by searching on the component um, or whatever it may be and see if there's been an re existing request for that. And then you can follow you know, the progress for that term here online. Uh, we have the downloads is all for the link release, the last link release and our accessory files in Rama. And then um, community participation uh, is here and you can look at those things. Um, so there's lots of uh, ways to find out more information um, on our website. And then we talked too about specifically SARS related, SARS CoV 2 or COVID 19 related content. We have two dedicated web pages for that. So it's really helpful. Um, and then this here is our new search um, tool that we've developed, the beta search, where you can search on LOINC or on parts, answer lists, and groups. So um, whatever aspect that you're working on with link codes, um, each of these might help in terms of finding what you need. Um, so if you, and, it, and then the other thing that it does is 
say if I search on the cystic fibrosis gene, CFTR, um, I can then filter down into what I'm most interested in. So we talked about properties. Um, and so say I'm reporting the number, if I would apply this, there should only be one term then. So it drills down and it can get to it right, right away. So if you're reporting the number of mutations um, tested for within that gene, um, then this would be your code that you would use for cystic fibrosis. So it really helps you drill down pretty quickly uh, based on all the different attributes for a given link term. Um, and then it you know, keeps your search history of different things that you looked for and you can clear that. Um, but again, we welcome feedback on this new, any bugs that you might find, just general feedback or new feature requests. So each of those are good. And then this one too is available um, in different languages. And then this is our existing search link. So if you log in, um, many of you may recognize this where it's a quick way to search terms, um, but it doesn't have the filtering mechanism like the new one, which we're really excited about. So any questions with um, our webpage or where to find things? Um, or the link Amy, model. do you want to do you want to uh -huh. show them the contact page in case they're not sure if they have a question sure. yet? And actually, uh, the quickest way is it down here? So we're on the right. Yeah, you know what? Top. I bet my Zoom thing's blocking. Oh yeah. And my Zoom was yeah. <laughs> my Zoom was blocking it. Okay, so yeah, here contact us, and this um, when you send it let us know what your uh, question is about, whether it's um, about COVID or whether it's about just in general link content, any of those things, uh, then we can help uh, triage where that question should go. So this is the best way to get in touch with us if you have any questions about anything. Great, Jamie, I don't see any other questions or hands raised. Okay. So I will thank everyone for joining. I will let, there was a question asked about if this um, presentation is recorded. The answer is yes, it is recorded and it will be available in a couple of weeks on our website. You will be able to have access to that with your login and we will send you an email notification when all of those items are ready. So um, if you wanna uh, review it again, it'll be available for you here shortly.